Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Christ United Methodist Church. My name is Katie. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we also have Pastor Nancy who is assisting in worship this morning. And we want to make sure to welcome all of you who are visitors, especially on this morning when we are celebrating the life of Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., as well as celebrating that our missionaries from Guatemala made it back safely. They'll be sharing a little bit more about where it is that they experienced God on their most recent excursion. And uh, we have so much to be celebrating and giving thanks for. I do want to point out so if you are here, which, raise your hand if you're here right now. Okay, most of you are here, at least in body. Uh, if you could fill out the visitors, uh, we have a friendship pad that we pass. And this is just a really helpful way for us to know that you are here and to be thinking of you, praying for you, and knowing how to contact you uh, in case of there's something that we want to share with you or want to invite you to participate in in the life of this church. We, this weekend, yesterday, celebrated the life of Kathy Colescott with a beautiful service, and much of their family is here, again, in worship, which is wonderful. We also watched the movie Selma to, that, that tells about a, a Martin Luther King story um, from uh, the march from Selma to Montgomery and talking about voting rights. So we have so much that's going on in the life of this church. I also want to start a very dangerous precedent that could come to haunt me forever. But I just want to announce that we have a couple birthdays today because I saw that people were wearing roses for it and then there was more birthdays going on. So I know that we have a 95-year-old which is to celebrate, Jean Dunn. We have Artie Bartel, 81 is something to celebrate, as well as Ali Ott, which 17 is something big to celebrate. So I think we should give a round of applause for our awesome birthday people. We're so grateful to be in worship. We also, this morning, have a third Sunday forum. Every third Sunday, uh, the third Sunday of the month, we have an opportunity where you can just show up. You don't have to have pre-registered to learn about something great that's going on. So um, you'll be hearing from a group called Isaiah this morning, which has a lot of amazing justice interfaith work uh, that they're doing in the community, and a lot we can learn about that. So. Without further ado, will you rise as you're able? Let us continue in worship through song.
may be seated. Will you pray with me? God, on this chilly morning, we are grateful to be in a warm space where we are seen and known and loved by you and by this community so interwoven and connected. God, may we be like a garment, a garment that is diverse but sewn together beautifully, a garment that is able to be strong and hold and carry the weight of the world. We ask God that we might be a people, a people that are shown to be different than each other sometimes, that argue sometimes and challenge one another sometimes, but remain united in love. May we be an example of the ways that we can differ in opinions, but still care about one another, still end the day laughing, still holding hands. God, we ask that you help us to remember that we are a unified people, a unified body of Christ. May we remember that we are only as strong and healthy as anyone else is when they are strong and healthy, that we are responsible for each other, responsible to care for those who are struggling. And so as one unified body, God, we are grateful to pray together, saying, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother, holy and blessed is your true name. We pray for your reign of peace to come. We pray that your good will be done. Let heaven and earth become one. Give us this day the bread we need, those who have none. Let forgiveness flow between us, from each one to each one. Lead us to holy innocence beyond the evil of our days. Come swiftly, Mother, Father, come. For yours is the power and the glory forever your name, all in one. Amen. I would like to invite the children forward for our time with children. I can bribe you with a little gift this morning. And I especially want to invite up our awesome readers, because we have a couple boys who are going to be doing a reading for us this morning. Good morning. Well, what do I have in this basket here? Bracelets. Yeah, these bracelets come from another country. Does anyone have a guess what country they come from? Yeah. Not Africa. That's a good guess. Yeah. Guatemala. That's a very good second guess. Yes, we have people who are coming back and be sharing about Guatemala today. And these bracelets are a little gift you can take to remember that uh, there's some beautiful artwork that is done in Guatemala and made in Guatemala. We also have uh, another thing we're talking about today. Does anyone know why you have off of school on Monday? Lex. These bracelets are now in North America. Yes, you are right about that. Does anyone know why they're off of school tomorrow? Yeah. Yes, tomorrow. Uh, Martin, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Excellent. Yes. And does anyone know what Martin Luther King Jr. did? Who was he? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So people who had brown and black skin, he helped make fair rights for them so that everybody was seen as equal. Did you know that? If someone looks different from you, if someone has, is from Guatemala, or someone has a lighter skin than you or darker skin than you, did you know that they're also people? Did you know that they are also your brothers and sisters that are just like you? 
even if they look really different from you, even if they're eight feet tall, or even if they're two feet tall, that they are people that are beautiful and loved by God. Did you know that? Good. I'm glad you all knew that. But it's a good thing to remember, because sometimes uh, we can look and wonder if people are different than us because they look different from us. So we're going to hear a little more about the story this morning. I'm going to invite you three boys. We're all going to stay up here. And you three boys are going to go and share a little story with us. So if you all want to turn so that you can see them, they're going to do a reading for us. Nancy will make sure that they can uh, reach the microphone over here. Microphone right there. Okay. Once upon a time, there was a man named Martin Luther King Jr. It's funny to think about because now we know his name so well. But at one time, just he was just a kid, like maybe you're gr- um, just a kid. Watching this as well, he was a kid too. Well, maybe you're growing up, that's okay too. All kids are welcome here, I don't discriminate. uh, Martin Luther King grew up to be a great man, of course. But then, yeah, then as it turned out, It wasn't so great in the world while he was growing up. Not everybody was treated like they were a somebody. I believe that you should treat everybody like it's their birthday, but they didn't do that. People looked at the color of their skin to decide if they were friends or not. Not cool, man. They decided to make him feel good that didn't make anybody feel good but his parents helped him grow up. He went to church, he learned about love, he grew up to be a minister I, to help a lot of people. He did all sorts of cool stuff. He helped a lot of people learn about love too, but he still looked around and said things should be better. He wanted to change things, so he did stuff. He decided instead of spreading the hate, he would spread the love. While people were hurting, he stepped in to help. He marched with them, he walked with them. He walked arm in arm with everyone, and sometimes it didn't go as well, but he kept going. Sometimes he ended up in prison, but he kept going. Some people didn't like him, but he kept going. Some days were hard. But he kept going. Love does that. It just keeps going. Even even when things are dark. And well, I don't like this part of the story, but things did get pretty dark. Someone who didn't agree with him shot him. He died in April 1968. Now, I got to tell you, some things, something, when things aren't awesome, it can be taught and things will not always be awesome. But your response can be like Mar- Martin Luther King's response was, it was awesome. He dreamed and he changed things and he dreamed and he kept sharing his dreams. They became not just his dreams, but all the people's dream. Let's dream like that that could change things. So did you hear what he was saying? They were, what those boys were saying? Didn't they do a good job reading the story? Yeah, they did a great job. You want to do a reading now, Lex? Well, I'm sure we can get you a reading to do sometime, too. So we remember the stories this weekend that tell us that even when we look different from each other or grow up in different places, that we are all beautiful and loved by God. And we remember that when we dream big and keep inviting people into our dreams, we can do awesome things. All right? So we can practice this love together. Let's say a prayer. Will you repeat after me? Dear God... Thank you for love. Thank you you that we are all different. different. 
thank you that we learn from each other. Amen. Wonderful. Well, now you get to go to Sunday school, and I want to know if one of you will bring this basket of bracelets out to the coffee table for me. Thank you so much. All right, follow your teachers. So this morning, the choir and I would like to invite you to sing our anthem with us. It's hymn number 149, Cantemos al Señor. We're going to sing that first stanza in Spanish, and then we're going to sing the first stanza below it in English. So we're singing through it twice. We'll take that second ending, which has a little tag on the end of it. You'll follow along, I think, just fine. If you're unsure of the Spanish, just relax. We're pretty relaxed here. Steve Barlow is helping us out on the conga drums this morning, so you'll see. It's just a fun, a fun time to relax and sing about the Lord in Spanish and in English. Please join us, 149, as you're seated. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Annika Zimmer, and I'm a sophomore at the University of Minnesota studying accounting and finance. And I'm Aiden Zimmer, I'm studying mechanical engineering and a Spanish study minor. <laughs> also at the U of M. So today we're here to talk about the YAM mission to Guatemala, which, as most of you should know, is a medical mission trip. So based on our backgrounds, it was kind of unlikely that we would go on this trip in the first place because we weren't sure what we could bring to this trip as more technical backgrounds, not in medicine. Um, this was also an unexpected trip for us, which was one of our God moments we want to talk about today because we weren't expecting to go on the YAM trip, but due to other circumstances, we were able to go and participate, which was something that neither of us had expected and was definitely something in God's plans for us. With, 
With our uh, limited uh, Spanish experience, I was able to help a lot of people on this trip pick up a few uh, Spanish words. Um, <clears throat> so, So Aiden and I, we both got to work in the optical department, so we helped fit Guatemalan people with eyeglasses. So I know I was really impressed with Aiden's Spanish skills when he was able to go up to patients and ask them if they could read clearly or if they could see the chart far away. And then we were able to go back and fit them with our sources of glasses we had brought from the US. It was incredible seeing the faces of patients as soon as they put on the pair of glasses they'd like. Sometimes you didn't even need the translators to ask, is it, is it good? Because you could just see it in their, fa in their faces. Like, it, it was incredible. Like, somebody who needed like really, really strong glasses and then they find a pair that actually works and their face just lights up and because they can see, finally. Um, also, um, one of our patients was a very, very elderly woman who we, we tried everything for her. We tried like 15 different pairs of glasses. She was one of our last patients for the day, so we made sure to go really slow. And no matter what we did, we just couldn't seem to find a pair that worked. But even at the end of the day, she was so grateful about everything, and she gave everyone hugs and thanked everyone. I think one of the great things about this trip was it allowed Aiden and I to get to meet more people from our church and from across the country for the other individuals who joined us on this trip, but also get to form relationships with the people in Guatemala and the translators we worked with. Um, so we're really blessed that our church sponsors this mission. Thank you. My name is David Lucas. I was privileged to go on this uh, mission trip. I want to say congratulations to this church uh, and the congregation for your support for something as wonderful as this mission trip. Uh, the people that we're able to serve uh, only see medical teams 
every three, six months, sometimes not that often. It's uh, indescribable to say how appreciative they are and how much need there is. Uh, I believe according to the figures I have, uh, we're able to help 301 people in, uh, on the medical side, 264 on the optical side, plus uh, many sunglasses uh, which are, are needed in that uh, area. The people are so appreciative, it, uh, it's a very humbling and inspiring experience to, uh, to assist in any way we can. I, I'm not a medical person, uh, I was doing weights and blood pressure, or weights and temperatures, and I had a great time with the children. Sometimes they had to wait for hours uh, before they were able to see, be seen by the medical teams. And uh, just uh, to interact with the people was a blessing to me. So again, I want to say thank you for the support from this congregation and others in the community and friends to make this wonderful mission possible and I hope that it can continue for many, many years to come. Thank you. It, okay, now you, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay. <laughs> My name is Darlene Lucas, and I wasn't in the bulletin because I'm an imposter today. <laughs> Many of you will remember Nikki Gensmer, who worked for this church for three years, I believe she said, who is now in Guatemala, and she was our team coordinator. She sent greetings back to you that she would like me to read to you today. Hello and good morning. My name is Nikki Gensmer. I currently work as team coordinator for Saluda Paz here in Kamancha, Guatemala. In a couple of weeks, I will already be celebrating my one year with Saluda Paz and my one year anniversary of moving abroad to live in Guatemala. The leap has been the scariest and the hardest and also the most wonderful and beneficial experience of my life. I have a personal connection to your church. Before moving here, I worked at CUMC in communications and design for three years. I'm forever grateful to my CUMC family and friends that inspired me, moved me, and supported me while in the States and also now in my move to live in Guatemala. Without CUMC, without my friend Pastor Katie stopping by my office every now and again to say, Hey, you should come to Guatemala with us next time. Planning meetings are starting. I'm not sure I ever would have ended up here in Guatemala. To say I felt called is sort of accurate, and I like thinking that. People refer to their mission experience abroad as such, but honestly, more so, I like to think that something larger than myself had this beautiful adventure in place for my life. This path, I just had to let myself surrender to the possibility. I used to serve on teams myself. Now each year, Jose Hernandez, myself, and the rest of the amazing Saluda Paz crew plan and host 20 to 40 medical, dental, optical, surgical, and construction mission teams in rural Guatemalan villages. In fact, when we left there Sunday morning, about 4.30, Nikki was on her way to meet up with another team, a construction team that would be there for a week. We have three clinics staffed by Guatemalan doctors, dentists, nurse, lab technician, social worker, and many other staff members. We have a full-time preschool, kindergarten, and first grade that helps children bridge the gap between speaking the Mayan language of Quiche to speaking the Spanish in the public schools they will hopefully someday attend. 
Salutopaz is making a difference, and it's important for you to understand that we couldn't do it without you. Your team just returned home to you in Rochester from a week-long mission in Guatemala with me as the host. They worked hard. We saw nearly 600, yes, 600 patients in a matter of four and a half days. And I'd like to say that we didn't turn anyone away, but the truth is we had to turn quite a few people away. The need in Guatemala is great. Everyone served fully, and I am so proud of my home team. Your church has been supporting and sending medical and optical missions to Guatemala through Salud Paz for 16 years now. Your church has given birth to six full-time volunteers moving their lives to Guatemala to work for Salud Paz because they believe so much in the organization, in the mission. Currently, it is myself and John and Jan Loggy who will also send you their love. You've supported the mission in thought, prayer, monetary donations, and many other ways. You should be proud. If you've served on a lead team yourself, thank you. If you haven't, I'd highly suggest you give it a go. I can say from firsthand experience that you truly make a difference. You make the world a better place. Your church is currently the only medical mission that also includes an inventory of distance or prescription glasses to bring to Guatemala. And I think we took around 3,000 pair this year. I write to you today for many reasons, to say hello to old friends, to thank you for your years of support, but also to instill the importance that your optical mission has on the people of Guatemala. Sometimes we are helping a patient see their weaving piece, their craft, their artwork, their well-being, clearly for the first time in their entire life. Sometimes we are helping the farmer protect their eyes with their first ever pair of glasses or sunglasses. I write to you today to tell you how very important your entire mission is, but specifically to tell you how rare your optical work with the Guatemalan brothers and sisters is. You are changing their lives, one seemingly simple pair of glasses at a time. Please do what you can to keep Guatemala in your mind and on your hearts this time of year and always. And know that I personally wouldn't have been able to do what I do, nor would the whole Salud Paz organization without your continued support. If you'd like to read more about the organization, visit saludapaz.org. If you'd like to see some of my photos and read about some of my personal experiences, you can visit my blog at elementalperspective.com. And I'm hoping we can put these in the spirit for people to click on. Sending you the utmost salud, health, and pause, peace from Guatemala as you make your way into 2019 and beyond. Thank you, Nikki Gensmer. To this, I would just like to add thanks to the hardworking team and to all of you who support us. While half of our patients were medical, we distributed 100 prescription glasses and almost 200 readers. In addition, we gave out between 350 and 400 sunglasses to children and adults, along with 165 handmade lease cases. One very interesting note was someone had donated a big bag full of purple Minnesota Vikings sunglasses. Try as we would, I think there are only two men in Guatemala with purple sunglasses. <laughs> they would not take them, even though we imitated it was football, football. But there are many, many elderly women in Guatemala proudly wearing Minnesota Vikings sunglasses <laughs> because they're purple. We need your financial support. We need your physical support. We purchase between five and six thousand dollars worth of medicine that we prescribe while we're there and give out. We purchase some of the sunglasses, some of the readers, some are donated. But we need your physical help to continue. And I would urge anyone with an interest to see me or Katie or one of the other leaders. We need leaders and planners as well as travelers. And one other note, most of you know we get our coffee from Mike in Guatemala. 
in Panat Shell. And I have some pictures out on the coffee table today of his coffee shop, of him, of his home, and a few other random places in Guatemala. Thank you. So in addition to helping support the missions uh, in Guatemala, your generous offerings help provide for uh, so many different gatherings right here in Rochester. Um, yesterday having the, the uh, service for Kathy Colescott, um, as well as the film uh, Selma to, to raise our racial understanding as well as um, supporting the kids that are in Sunday school, uh, as well as uh, yesterday a gentleman came by needing a shower. Um, your gifts support ministry in so many different ways, and so thank you uh, for your generous gifts, and I would invite the ushers now to wait upon us to receive our, our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings.
God of endless love, we know we have taken baby steps toward the life you've called us to live. The giving is easy compared to the kind loving you expect us to extend to others, a love that is patient, unselfish, forgiving, and full of hope that endures through anything. May we grow in our giving but even more in our loving, as your Son taught us. And so, as we pray together, God, you are glory. We come before you to ask that you would use Christ United Methodist Church to broadcast your grace. Use us to serve you and our neighbors. Call us to boldly and tenderly reveal your glory. Stir us and lead us to be your witnesses. Wake us up and plant possibility in our hearts. We pray through the powerful heart of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So today we are celebrating the many ways that we are doing powerful work in this world through our Guatemala mission. And we're also celebrating the many ways that we have seen leaders over the years bring justice for all, bring God's kingdom here on earth. Specifically, we think about Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. And of course, because this is a church, we are also talking about Jesus and Jesus' legacy in the ways that uh, he helped people. As we hear all these stories, as we hear our scripture this morning, as we think about the legacy that gives kids a day off of school this weekend, as we think about the ways that we serve in mission, and as we are connected to people all over the world, it can be a little intimidating to talk about all these magnificent things that happen Maybe you are like me, and sometimes you get to a place where you just wonder, wow, I don't know if I could help quite like that. I know when I first started working here at Christ Church, I did not think that I was going to be able to go to Latin America to serve on a mission trip. I was not sure that that was in my uh, description, my job description, in my skill set specifically. Maybe you similarly have felt that with ways that you have been called to serve. You felt like, there's no way that I could quite handle that. Insert whatever that service opportunity thing is there. You can look at people like Martin Luther King Jr. And you can look at people like Jesus. You could think, well, they were special. Jesus was God, after all. So he should be able to do some pretty great things to help people, right? If God can't, then who can? We can get a little intimidated. We can also sometimes see the problems and the needs of the world around us. And we just feel like, is there any way that we could actually make a dent in those things that are happening? We see all the things that are happening around us and we say, you know what, we have so little control. We see that our government is partially shut down. We see the friends and family around us, we see them facing medical issues, we see them facing money issues, and we recognize that we can't save everybody. 
And so it feels like it's even hopeless to start sometimes when we have so little control on the outcome. And has anyone ever read the book Toxic Charity or When Helping Hurts? I know we've done some book studies on those before. Sometimes you think you want to help somebody and you're wondering, is this even helping? Is this actually doing more harm than good? How is it that we know when is the right time to step in and serve? When is the right time to go? In our scripture today, we find Jesus, and this is sort of his inaugural address. This is a time of year where there's either an inaugural address or usually there's a State of the Union address. And similarly, Jesus at this point in our year is doing his inaugural address. Jesus is 30 years old at the time, my age, so I can be a little intimidated sometimes. I'm not quite at Jesus' level of success yet, probably never. And he has this very excellent speech that actually echoes what his mother sang just, just a little bit before, her Magnificat, about being called by God and called to serve God. And he goes before all of uh, the people around him in the temple, and he reads from the scroll of Isaiah. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We hear this mission statement of Jesus that his whole life is around setting the oppressed, the captives free, seeking out and living with the poor. What I find interesting about this scripture is not just what he's saying here, but actually where he came from right before the scripture. And again, it's interesting what happens immediately afterwards. He started with the devil in the wilderness. Jesus was fasting for 40 days. He was journeying away from home to connect with God and center himself around this task before him. This is sort of like what Pastor Elizabeth is doing in Australia. She's landed safely, by the way, in case you're not on Facebook. Or like the Guatemala team did, went out into an unknown world, many of whom, like the Zimmer kids, who they didn't really specify, but they figured out they were going on this trip like four days before they left, or maybe a week before they left. That was uh, just how spontaneous that experience was. It's a wilderness place, a place that is unfamiliar. We grow when we're in these wilderness places because we're suddenly left with a lack of something Maybe you've gone through a wilderness place when you've experienced a loss in your life. Or maybe you have intentionally sought out a wilderness place. Maybe you've given something up for Lent before. Maybe you've chosen to ignore your phone for a day. Maybe you have fasted from sugar or TV for a while. When we experience a little bit of deprivation in some way, we can come to be centered and come to understand ourselves a little more. So Jesus was in this wilderness place, and in that place, the devil, who sort of symbolizes the ways that, the conflicts that Jesus was going through, the devil tempts him with control. Jesus knows that he is called to serve and live with the poor, but it's the devil that says, you could figure out your own way to do that. You could make it a lot easier on yourself. You could take matters into your own hands. You could control and manipulate the situations around you in a different way, in a more violent way, in a more aggressive way. This is one thing we can learn from this passage. We can look at the experience of Jesus and recognize that in order to come to the center of who we are, of who God has called us to be, sometimes we need to start first with a wilderness place 
We need to start first by looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing ourselves more clearly and understanding who it is we are and who it is and what it is we're really about, who it is that God has called us to be before we step out to try to help the world. I heard this weekend about something called a mirror test. And maybe you have, any of you who've studied psychology have maybe heard about this. It was a measure of self-awareness developed in the 1970s. And the test is one way that scientists can tell, specifically with animals, and sometimes they look with humans as well, but it's a self-awareness test, whether you can see if the self is separate from the mirror or whether you can recognize that yourself is an object in a mirror. So how it works is that the person, usually maybe a child or an animal, is shown themselves in the mirror. And then sneakily, I'm not sure how they do this without alerting the animal or the person, but they have to try to put a piece, a little bit of red dye, an odorless dye, on the creature so they can see it. Imagine like a a Rudolph nose situation. And then they show them the mirror again. And it could be that some of the animals see the red dot but just don't really care. I don't know, maybe you've had those days where you just look at yourself in the mirror and just decide, I'm not going to mess with that. But these animals would usually be a little bit either curious or disturbed by the fact that they have a little bit of red on their face. And so they try to do something about it. Animals which have passed the mirror test are common chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, dolphins, elephants, humans, but not usually until they are about two years old. And possibly pigeons have passed the mirror test. We know maybe you are someone who has a lot of mirrors in your house. Maybe you're someone who has no mirrors in your house. But we are a culture that has a complicated relationship with seeing ourselves. Many of us are like the dogs in the mirror test, or the babies less than a year old. Less than a year old babies and dogs have a similar experience, which is that they react to mirrors with fear or with apathy. When we get a good look at ourselves and our imperfections, many of us are taught to be disappointed, so we just don't want to look. Maybe you find yourself in a slightly terrifying category, which is that of birds, which often attack their own reflections. We see the imperfections in ourselves, and we just want to destroy them. We can get really frustrated, and we want to surgically remove things, and we want to cover things up with makeup, or we want to just avoid people altogether on some days. It's important for our development to be able to recognize ourselves and see and look and understand ourselves. And I also wonder if we can get to a place not only where we're taking the time to take a look at ourselves, find practices that help us mirror ourselves back, but also can we get to a place where we're consistently looking at other people and seeing ourselves in them? Practicing not seeing other people as other, but seeing other people as a part of us. There are a few ways we can practice these uh, mirror reflection times. We can go into the wilderness like Jesus, but there's other ways beyond just going to Guatemala or beyond other challenging experiences. We can simply start to practice noticing noticing how we're feeling mindfully. We can practice self-care, allowing ourselves to take a day off, allowing ourselves to be bored sometimes, and then think and notice what comes up in our brains when we're not saturated by outside input all the time. When we really are taking care of ourselves and looking at ourselves, we recognize that we are complex beings. And then we start to realize that other people, too, are complex beings. And that maybe when we do step out of our mirror zone, of our wilderness place, we start to see that other people are more than just people we need to give bread or water to. Other people are complex beings that need kind of love and care that only relationship can give 
that only God can give, that only by empowering other people, not just giving to them, that sort of empowering of work, give, letting people do their own work to help themselves, this is the kind of work that lasts forever and impacts and transforms a life. This is why this service in Guatemala is impactful, not just because it's something of uh, handing pills to people or handing glasses to people, it's also about the relationships, about seeing people eye to eye, seeing them clearly and telling them that yes, we see you and you matter and God loves you and we love you. Knowing that we are a global community connected to one another in Christ. I wanted to close today with a poem that I read this week from a powerful poet who just passed away. This is Pastor Elizabeth's hero in many ways, Mary Oliver. She's an inspirational, spiritual writer. And Mary Oliver speaks on the conviction of how it is that we can learn to help and change the world around us in her poem called The Journey. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began. Though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles, mend my life, each voice cried. But you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do. Though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible, it was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voice behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds and there was a new voice, which you slowly recognized as your own. That kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life that you could save. May you too be inspired to tend to yourself, knowing that when you look deeply at your own gifts, at your own strengths, at the ways that you can care for yourself, then you can better invite the world into this healing journey. That your impact, that your hope for changing the world around you will be much more impactful. Instead of trying to control the people around you and trying to change things directly, you can work first at changing yourself. So ask yourself today, Look at your life, at the ways you live and love and serve and care for yourself. Are you able to let go? To let go of control, of the future, of people's opinions? Are you able to help yourself so that you may really be grounded in God's love and grace for you even when you get rejected? So that you might really help others. What mirror practice can you take on this year until you finally know what you have to do and begin? Amen. Will you rise as you're able and let us sing?
courage to look in the mirror and say, I am beautiful. Will you practice that with me? I am beautiful. Inside and out, you are gorgeous and powerful, and God has called you to amazing work. So take care of yourself that you may help others in a way that is world-impacting. Amen.